And this is why it had to be a coalition. This is why it had to be the Republican establishment. It had to be limited government conservatives. It had to be libertarians. It had to be populist. It had to be economic nationalists. It had to be evangelical Christians. If you have the wisdom, the strength, the tenacity to hold that coalition together, we will govern for 50 to 75 years. Losers! This is by far the most serious and politically charged indictment. He's accused of undermining a foundational principle of American democracy, the peaceful transfer of power. For every conservative in America, this is what happens in the last days of a dying regime. They will never shut me up. They'll have to kill me first. His best qualities. Well, he's tenacious, he's articulate, he's erudite, he's exciting in, in a way, you know, he's, he's, he's unusual. You, know, you don't often see political figures like Bannon. You certainly don't see them in such close proximity to power in the White House. So, you know, he might be like a once in a lifetime figure. He's a guy who has created a, a, an internally coherent belief system which explains in, in some way the, the, the precarity and, the, and, the, and the, the insecurity felt by tens of millions of, of Americans. He captured a moment in history. If you want to see the Trump agenda, it's very simple. It was all in the speeches. He went around to these rallies, but those speeches had tremendous amount of content in them, right? I happen to believe, and I think many others do, he's probably the greatest public speaker in those large arenas since William Jennings Bryan. This was galvanized. And remember, we didn't have any money. Hillary Clinton, these guys had over $2 billion. We had a couple of hundred million dollars. It was those rallies and those speeches. All right, we don't want to win so much. We're getting tired of winning. It's getting boring. It's always worth remembering in politics that Movements that have an enormous impact tend to be led by a very small number of people, but those people tend to be highly committed, very radical, completely sure of themselves. They have a very strong belief in themselves, a very powerful sense of agency that they are at the frontier of history and that they're shaping and cultivating these currents that are sweeping through politics. And I think Steve Bannon is one of those people. I think he clearly sees himself as part of the vanguard who is able to shape and influence mass opinion on some of these issues. And looking back over the last six, seven years since the Trump presidency, he, he and Trump clearly did that. Bannon's only a Republican because you've got to be one or the other in order to take power in America. You know, Trump's and Bannon, they're not, they're not real Republicans. They're, they're actually, in some ways, they're sort of anarcho-populists who just happen to be under the flag of republicanism. For someone like Bannon, he sees an establishment. He sees an administrative state. He sees these old republicans, the Ryan Republicans, the old establishment republicans. And these are like entrenched interests which how do you fight that? How do you bring change to America in the face of these entrenched interests? Well, you blow them up. And once you've blown them up, then you can introduce your version. But the blowing up was very important because without the blowing up, there is no Bannon-style change. Hello, 
people's political ideology can come from any variety of sources. In many instances, it, it, it comes from our parents. Many people vote the same way as their parents. Or some people witness events that makes them look at the world in a new way. And actually one of the key events for Steve Bannon and what really influences his political ideology is looking at the hostage crisis in the late 1970s under the Jimmy Carter presidency and seeing the Iranians kidnapping all these Americans and holding them hostage for, for, for weeks and weeks and months. And, and for Bannon, who was at this point serving in the US Navy, you know, this supposedly mighty power was being given a, a, a humiliation and, and a kind of bloody nose by a relatively small country. And for Bannon, this felt kind of disgraceful. And so this is one of those germs that's going to give rise to Bannon's ideology. I think in some respects, when I look at Steve Bannon, I sort of see a synthesis of lots of different ideas that have come from lots of different thinkers and literatures, and he sort of moulded them into this quite reactionary, if not revolutionary, view of where democracy, and in particular where the American Republic, is headed. Bannon has these three pillars of thinking. The first is national security and sovereignty. That's defending your homeland, whether that's building a wall between the US and Mexico, whether that's slapping travel bans on basically anybody from a country that happens to be Islamic. The rule of law is going to exist when you talk about our sovereignty and you talk about immigration. Then he has this whole idea of economic nationalism in which you are promoting an economic system that is protectionist, is there simply to protect your economy and basically you don't care about the rest of the world. Which is a, an isolationist idea which has never really worked out very well for America. I think one of the most pivotal uh, moments in modern American history was his immediate withdrawal from TPP. That got us, out of a, got us out of a trade deal and let our sovereignty come back to ourselves and start to bring jobs, high value added manufacturing jobs back to the United States of America. Then you've got this third pillar, which Bannon calls the kind of deconstruction of the administrative state. Now, by deconstruction, he's not saying destruction, even though to most people it frankly is. Deconstruction is a process of taking everything apart, looking at it and, and rebuilding it in a different way. You know, it was also more narrowly a political project. He saw the, the bureaucracy as a, a point where his radical project to reimagine America would be halted. And so it's deconstruction its dismantlement is one of the first stages in the process of change. But the third, this regulation, it, you oh, know, yeah. every business leader we've had in is right. saying not just taxes, but it is, right. uh, it is also the regulation. And I think the consistent, if you look at these cabinet appointees, they were selected for a reason, and that is the deconstruction. The way the progressive left runs is if they can't get it passed, they're just going to put it in some sort of regulation in, a, uh, in an agency. That's all going to be deconstructed. What makes a successful propagandist is the ability to ram home a very simple message over and over again. It's also to have a message that actually taps in to someone's heart as well as their head. And it was Bill Clinton who famously said, you know, you campaign in poetry, but you govern in prose. A propagandist is actually not interested in the messy business of, of governing. A propagandist is simply there to get you into power and to keep your power. Going back in time, there was a lot of buzz and interest on the right of politics around Breitbart and what Breitbart was trying to do, and it was trying to provide an alternative platform for conservatives who felt that the mainstream media, or fake news, was not doing its job and they wanted a, a different platform. So Breitbart sort of emerged to sort of fill that space. It was the centre 
Breitbart world and Bannon world. Bannon actually used to live there. He didn't have a home. He crashed in the, in the company offices. There was always, you know, parties and influential people going in and out. And, and it was, for a, for a while, the centre of conservative politics. Individuals that were working with Steve Bannon and indeed Bannon himself clearly began to have quite a strong impact on the debate in America. And that, I suspect, is how Bannon ended up becoming quite close and connected to the Trump campaign. Their meetings were infrequent and, and sporadic and quick. They're outsiders, right? In some respects, Trump is the ultimate insider, but he, he is ultimately an outsider. He's laughed at by the elite. He has a giant chip on his shoulder. He has never really felt that he belongs and he's never really felt he's been given the respect and the, you know, and the deference that, that, that he thinks he deserves. And I think probably Bannon is, is similar. So these two outsiders, renegades, sort of collided and came together and probably saw something in themselves in one another and probably that helped to cement their relationship. When Breitbart himself dies and Bannon effectively takes over, Breitbart changes its tone. It's less sort of interested in Hollywood and entertainment stuff. Uh, it's much more about politics, the culture, things that, that Bannon is frankly interested in. Andrew Breitbart died in 2012 and Bannon took it down an alt-right path. There are lots of different readers of Breitbart, but what they all are is united by, the, by this idea that the American state and the way Western states exist is no longer tolerable. They all think that there should be some form of revolution. I am officially running for President of the United States and we are going to make our country great again. Breitbart's funded by a father and daughter couple called Robert Mercer and Rebecca Mercer. And Robert Mercer uh, made billions. He's a true billionaire, not a fake billionaire like Trump. He made billions in finance and he's used a proportion of this money to fund lots of sort of conservative groups and alt-right groups. And so he was basically bankrolling Breitbart and Bannon, who'd always attached himself to rich men, was, was just sort of beholden in some senses to Robert Mercer and, and his daughter, Rebecca Mercer, for their funding. I'm the messenger. I'm just really the messenger. Although I've been a very good messenger, let's face it, right? Mid-2016, Trump's campaign uh, is in trouble. It looks very much like Trump is going to lose. You know, he's 10, 12, 15 points down in lots of polls against Hillary Clinton. Um, he sacks his campaign manager, Paul Manafort, but he doesn't have anyone to replace him. But the Mercers uh, make a move uh, and they persuade Trump to appoint Steve Bannon as his campaign manager in August 2016. Republican Donald Trump is overhauling his campaign again. Overnight, we learned Trump is bringing in Breitbart News' Stephen Bannon as a campaign CEO and promoting one of his pollsters to campaign manager. The move comes just 82 days before the election and represents Trump's second campaign shakeup in two months. What Bannon sees in Trump is a like-minded figure a disruptor, someone who doesn't want to obey the rules, someone who looks at the state as it is and thinks that it's broken and dirty and corrupt. Trump, in many ways, was an ideal candidate because he was a, he was a blank canvas. And Trump had a, you know, he, he had had a sense that, sort of unspoken really, but you know, as, as a real estate developer in New York, he saw sort of Japanese money coming in and buying up buildings that he wanted and, and a hostility developed towards this sort of fo this foreign money. Um, so he, he was not on board with the Bannon Project writ large, mainly because he probably was ignorant of the Bannon Project writ large, but there was enough synergies there for this to work. Trump really became 
a master of the big set pieces, um, the big rallies, the arenas, um, using charisma, using new media, alternative media, and being completely willing and enthusiastic to attack established media. In some respects, it was a it was a fusion of the old and the new. And in 2016, for whatever, for lots of reasons we now know, he did understand mass psychology and he did outflank much of the elite. This is a historic night. The American people have spoken and the American people have elected their new champion. I've never said I'm a perfect person, nor pretended to be someone that I'm not. Trump didn't think he would win. Bannon didn't think he would win. They were as shell-shocked as everybody else. They were planning all sorts of things for the post-election period. None of them involved governing. None of them involved in being president. None of them involved the White House. It doesn't really matter in a sense, you know, was it Bannon or not? What matters is that Bannon thought it was him <laughs> and that for a while at least Trump thought it was Bannon and he was prepared on the back of that to give Bannon this great power in the White House. You know, Bannon became a sort of Svengali figure. It's the perception that matters here as much as the reality. Key players perceived it to be the case that Bannon had won it. Bannon then joined him on his staff as an advisor, a very key advisor. And what Bannon's there to do is to say to Trump, this is the direction of travel. These are the type of policies that we should bring about. You know, you have this mandate to sort of create chaos, if you like, to sort of overturn the system, to look at everything afresh, not to obey the normal rules of politics and diplomacy. And Bannon hadn't worked in politics until a few months before. His first job in politics was as Trump's campaign manager. And a few months later, they're in the White House. So it was chaos because of a lack of experience, on the one hand. It was chaotic also because the, the key principles were at war with each other. We have Steve Bannon. We have Jared Kushner who doesn't really have a formal role, but he's a member of the family and he's absolutely a key player in all this. We have his daughter, Ivanka, and we also have at the beginning, Reince Priebus, who's allegedly, formerly, his chief of staff. And they just fight and fight and fight. There was no steerage from the president. The president must set the tone. The president must set the direction. And only then can people like the chief of staff manage the White House. But in Trump's White House, the chief of staff spent most of his time managing up, managing the president, when he should have been managing down. And then we've got bomb throwers like Bannon in there, making it all so much worse. We were troubled when the president-elect announced that Steve Bannon would be a senior advisor in the White House. He, in his own words, has presided over making his former business, Breitbart, the platform for the alt-right. This loose-knit group of white supremacists, anti-Semites, and racists. As far as Bannon's concerned, American society has faced four great crises. There's the revolution, there's the civil war, there's the Great Depression, and the fourth is happening in Bannon's eyes today and that is mass immigration. He regards that as cataclysmic. Certainly Bannon's pushing a sort of a judo-Christian view of the world, where America is a, it's a white country, it's a, it's a Christian country, to some extent isolated from the world, because as soon as you open yourself up to the world, whether it's through trade or whether it's through immigration, that, that, that goal um, of having sort of a homogenous population dies. So this sort of withdraw, there's in a sense that the American needs to withdraw inwards 
to protect these, these core values, which is white, it's Christian, and it's not brown and it's not Muslim. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States until our country's representatives can figure out what the hell is going on. Should I do it? Yeah! Bannon thinks the establishment, the bureaucracy, is the enemy. And so he wants to swerve around these establishment elites who he thinks will undermine or attenuate his, his project of change. Bannon didn't want to take that route because he thought these were veto points. These would all try to block his proposed policy changes. So essentially, the Muslim travel ban was written at his direction by, by Stephen Miller at a time when the bureaucrats had all gone home and no one could stop it. And the effect was absolute chaos at the nation's airports. But Bannon indicated that that was exactly what he wanted. He wanted it to cause chaos. This is going back to Ban Bannon as a bomb thrower theme, which is you know, very prevalent here. And that was Bannon's way. Well, isn't it better now than later? Trump and Bannon will defend themselves to this day by saying, no, we're not banning Muslims, we're just banning people from these countries where a lot of bad people we think happen to be. And that's how they defend it. They knew it was going to be controversial, and they liked the fact it was controversial. There was no way that the Muslim travel ban, uh, as conceived in any of its three iterations, would have passed Congress. It, there was some, there's too many veto points in that institution for that to become law. So the executive order is the only way to do it. Now, executive orders, they have to be lawful. The Muslim travel ban was determined not to be lawful and was struck down uh, by various courts. They rewrote it a second time, that was also struck down. A third time, it was allowed to go into effect, but it was in a much attenuated form compared with that first incendiary executive order, which was issued a week into Trump's presidency. The reason Wrights and I are good partners is that we can disagree. It's not only not going to get better, it's going to get worse every day in the media. <laughs> and here's why. But by the way, the internal logic makes sense. They're corporatist, globalist media that are adamantly opposed, adamantly opposed to an economic nationalist agenda like Donald Trump has. President Trump really laid this out, as Ryan said, many years ago at CPAC. It's really CPAC that have really originally gave him the springboard. It's the first time at Breitbart we started seeing him and see, saw how people, re, you know, his speeches resonated with people. And then he would go out to these smaller uh, town halls later and really he got traction with the same message he's bringing today. Here's the only, re here's why it's going to get worse. Because he's going to continue to press his agenda. And as economic conditions get better, as more jobs get better, they're going to continue to fight. If you think they're going to give you your country back without a fight. You are sadly mistaken. He was an absolutely key figure for, for six months, or probably nearly a year. Um, he was one of the most important people in the world. Yeah, he was absolutely central to everything that was going on in the United States. From you know, August 2016, when he joined the Trump campaign, to his uh, leaving the White House a year or so later. Now, he's a key figure. Um, in Am American history. Bannon's relationship with banker Trump and Jared Kushner is disintegrating several months into the, into the presidency. His relationship with Reince Priebus is at an all-time low. Reince Priebus and Bannon leave the White House very close together. But the White House, you know, it probably couldn't carry on functioning with that, with that level of internecine warfare between the key players. Um, so very quickly, Priebus goes, um, Bannon goes, 
okay, the family stays, Ivanka stays, Jared stays, but there's a new, a new person in charge now, John Kelly, or at least he thinks he's a new person in charge, but he faces exactly the same problem that Reince Priebus did, which is having to manage Trump. But he spends most of his time managing up and not what he should be doing, which is managing down and organising the White House. It's probably, possibly the most thankless job in the world, is being Trump's chief of staff. Bannon probably, in hindsight, wanted to go much further than Trump did. I think probably Bannon was much more of a revolutionary, whereas Trump may have been, and indeed I think now history has shown, was probably more of a reactionary. You know, he loved alienating and irritating the elite, but once you gave Trump power, he didn't really know what to do with it. I mean, there wasn't really a kind of thought through full-blown ideological projects, it was a bit of status quo here, a bit of that. Whereas I think had Bannon been allowed to stay in the White House, had been given real power, had been dominant over the Trump family, I think actually the Trump presidency would have looked completely different. I think it probably would have looked much more radical and revolutionary. And I suspect it probably would have looked quite a lot darker. And this is why it had to be a coalition. This is why it had to be the Republican establishment. It had to be limited government conservatives. It had to be libertarians. It had to be populist. It had to be economic nationalist. It had to be evangelical Christians. If you have the wisdom, the strength, the tenacity to hold that coalition together, we will govern for 50 to 75 years. It's not about your, your race, your color, your gender, your religion, your ethnicity your sexual preference, it's about one thing. Are you a citizen of the United States of America? Because if you're a citizen, there's certain responsibility and obligations that come with that. But as a citizen also, you should have preference for jobs and economic opportunities. Think of what went in to build this country. Are you prepared to give it up and let these elites take it and just give it away? That's the power that elected Donald Trump. That's the power that's gonna elect Roy Moore tomorrow. That's the power they fear. You know what they're doing when they're trying to shut up President Trump and Judge Moore? They're trying to shut you up. To Mitch McConnell and Senator Shelby, Con and this is a national election. It is the Trump miracle versus the nullification project. Now they couldn't beat Trump and they couldn't beat you. For him, it was about what does he do after the White House? What does he do now being on the outside of the White House? And I think probably Europe was, in his mind, the obvious next step. You had crunch elections, you had political parties and leaders that were clearly beginning to do quite well. And I think in his mind, it was very much about trying to attach himself to new movements or new vehicles that would allow him to maximize his influence. He gets into bed all over Europe, frankly, with some really distasteful people. And I think this is when it's a moot point as to where you think Steve Bannon crossed the line. But certainly, certainly after he leaves the White House, he ends up getting into bed with more and more distasteful people. Look at these campaigns. It's not all, all negativism. It's about what they can be as countries. It's about saving their country. It's not just fear and loathing. That's an oversimplification. I met Steve Bannon over coffee at a hotel in Mayfair, London. My impression of him at that time was that he was clearly feeling that world events were moving in his direction, was clearly feeling that Europe was about to follow America, and was very busy networking and making relationships and forging links with people on this side of the Atlantic. And so when I met him at that particular time, remember this is before we enter the second part of Trump's presidency, I think he felt that, that the world was his oyster and he was very aware of his influence. I remember 
sitting across the table from Steve Bannon and looking at a copy of my book that he'd read and the notes were were endless. I mean, he seemed to give the impression that he consumes and digests research incredibly quickly and moves on to the next thing. Actually, I don't, no, no, to be fair, you said you disagreed with Tommy yeah. Robinson on yeah, Islam. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, you, but clap, before, clap, the break, no, before the break, clap. you said... He wasn't before the break. He said he wasn't Islamophobic. Well, I don't. I, I said I don't know if Islam he. Islam is not a religion of peace. Islam it, is fascist and it's violent, and we've had enough. They're I don't. I don't know. I don't head. know if I. You know, Islamic phobia about shipping guys out and stuff like that. I don't know if Tommy's like that. I mean, but he and I disagree about the religion of Islam. Okay, but I don't think Tommy's a bad guy. I think he's a solid guy, and I think he's got to be released from prison. <laughs> I think the vote for Brexit was very important for populists around the world. It demonstrated that voters could be led to rebel against the established elite in a democracy that historically has not really had populist revolts. I think it also showed many people around the world, including Steve Bannon and Donald Trump, that there was a deep reservoir of public disillusionment with the status quo. The past of independence. And that in every Western society, that was probably there and could be mobilized and could be turned into a serious political project. So actually, on one level, it's tempting to see Brexit as something that was inherently British, was about Britain's relationship with the European Union. But actually, for many people around the world, including Bannon, I think Brexit was proof of concept that you can mobilize the masses against the elite. That's why of everything that's going on, even in Brexit and even with Trump, with all the resistance, yours is the most important experiment. Because here, you're trying to make it work with people putting aside sometimes foundational principles to try to make it work. That's why all the media is here. It's not to see some schmendrick like me. It's because they want to look at every mistake your government makes. If every the Brothers of Italy and the League and others put their shoulder to the wheel, like you have shown in the past, and stand for decency and grit and common sense, that you can not just have tremendous electoral results in the spring of 19, but send a message to Brussels. One of the tensions was that many populist movements have been on the go in Europe for 30 years, 40 years. Many of the people that he's talked to and talked about come from movements that have a very rich history. Marine Le Pen, uh, Matteo Salvini, the Austrian Freedom Party. You know, these are movements that can often be traced back to the 1970s, if not much earlier. So, you know, the kind of American coming over and professing his worldview and what needed to be done was always going to be a risky balancing act because many of these movements have been doing it for 40, 50 years, right? So they view Trump as being late to the party, whereas some of the Trumpists view these movements as being, you know, the new boys on the block. So there was always that tension between, between the two. But Bannon clearly saw potential in trying to bring these movements together and trying to give them some sense of organization and unity. And, you know, if you look historically at populist movements in Europe, one thing that has run through them all, even the successful ones, is that they've not really ever managed to unify and to coordinate and to project a, 
a, a unified front. So unlike communist parties or socialist parties or green parties at the European level that have always kind of, you know, been pretty good at coordinating, uh, national populists have struggled for good reasons. I mean, they're nationalists. So they've always argued over territory and history and, you know, who gets what. France and Italy and these other parties together is quite powerful, but they have the ability to put together, put aside some differences and to really form a super group that will have real critical mass and I think will have will play above its punch above its weight as far as a group goes. That's why I think these next three or four weeks are gonna be vitally important. The integration movement, which is what the EU has always been about, the, that continual inexorable pull is dead. You will not see in Brussels. Juncker or any of that crowd pushing forward more integration, they understand the people in Europe backed off that. That's the, that's the historic thing of yesterday. Two years ago, almost to the week, after Brexit and Trump, Macron had ended it. He was a product of the system. The defeat of Le Pen was not just a defeat, it was a public humiliation. And I think she's the key that picks the lock. Salvini will clearly be there. I think Le Pen is the one that can can be magnanimous or show wisdom. I think she's shown incredible wisdom. I don't think she gets the credit for this. I think she's she's not just a astute tactical politician. She has she actually understands strategy. I think she understands the importance of the supergroup. I'm a friend and colleague. I will make I will make observations uh, and give my opinions are you where paid, they saw. Are you no, absolutely, the, the, absolutely not. I've never I've never take I've never taken a penny in any political activity. Trump never paid me. I have, no, I've never taken a penny. I'm not a, the first time I ever went to a campaign office is the day I took over as Trump CEO. I'm not a, I'm not a professional you, po political, I'm not a professional political what, consultant. What I say? probably could turn it. Trump is struggling to get money from Congress to, to build the wall. Throw him an odd billion here or there to repair the wall. We're not going to give him any money for a new wall. And so Bannon and a couple of associates hatched this plan to sol uh, solicit private donations from, well, not only from Trump supporters, but from, for people who, who want to build a wall. And I think they raised something like $25 million you know, this is a private tax fund that you know what you're getting. This money is going directly to fund a wall on the southern border. We have been down on that border every single day nearly for the last two months, meeting with contractors. And they don't spend it on the wall, of course. They use it for their own interests. There's lots of people on the right who use the Trump White House to enrich themselves, but I don't think anyone has done it so brazenly as Steve Bannon. So, thank you very much for joining us, guys. Hey, a big cheer. Thank you, one America. Steve Bannon has been arrested and what? indicted by the Manhattan U.S. Attorney, uh, federal prosecutors in Manhattan. For more on that, we'll get to our Eamon Jabbers. Hey, Eamon. Yeah, Carl, this news just coming out from the Southern District of New York saying that Steve Bannon and three other men uh, have been arrested and indicted uh, and charged in relation to their role uh, in a nonprofit organization called We Build the Wall. It's a crowdfunding organization that the SDNY says uh, has raised about $25 million. This entire fiasco is to stop on, people who want to build the wall. Get in, sir. Hey, hey, get inside the car. Get inside the car. He's a very clever guy. He's very erudite. You know, he's a good command of history. You know, what led him to think that this would be a good idea? It, it, it's baffling in a way. Well, it's baffling in every way. And this led, of course, 
to, to Trump's pardon uh, of, of Bannon, but Trump can only pardon federal crimes. So Bannon is still on the hook for this as a state crime. He's had one get of jail card cash by Trump. There's no others available to him. In August 2020, as many of you know, Bannon and three other individuals were indicted by the US Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York for crimes related to this fundraising scheme. And then, just months later, Mr. Bannon received a presidential pardon from President Donald J. Trump, former President Donald J. Trump. Because the simple truth is that it is a crime to profit off the backs of donors by making false pretenses. Yeah. Comment? This is an irony. On the very day the mayor of this city has a delegation down on the border, they're persecuting people here and they're trying to stop them on the border. This is all about 60 days from the day. 60 days from the day. 60 days. For every conservative, this is what happens in the last days of a dying regime. They will never shut me up. They'll have to kill me first. I have not they been took money from Mr. Bannon. Have you told the administrative state? Have you told the administrative the state? They said you frauded Americans. How do you respond? Every one of you in this audience, audience is nothing but a pauper. Oh, you know why you're a pauper? Because the Federal Reserve, the oligarchs on Wall Street, the oligarchs in, in Silicon Valley, in the Uniparty in Washington, D.C. Don't ask me. Look at your own lived experience. Today, go home and look at your bank account. See what inflation is doing to you. See what you are part of your capital market. You're all in bondage. What the you Did you, you defraud Americans? Was the build a wall a scheme? Was the build a wall a scheme? We have made America safe again. To be what is now the mainstream of the Republican Party, which is you know, the front part of the Republican Party, it's not, it's not about where you stand on policy. It's not a policy position. It's essentially determined about your position on Trump and the 2020 election. So to be part of the, the Trump crowd, to be part with this group, you have to be an election denier. That's it, that's the litmus test. It's not a policy test. It's a, it's, it's, you have to show your allegiance to Trump. I mean, I don't know, what were they, what were they expecting? <laughs> did, did they, did they think that there's a crowd outside the ellipse, Trump gives a speech, other people give a speech. They encourage them to, you know, to, to, to march down to, to the to the to the capital to, to Congress. What did they expect would happen there? That the the members of Congress would look out the window and see this big crowd and then stop certifying the election. I mean, I, I don't I don't know what were they were expecting at that moment. I think those events were clearly shaped by narratives that were rife on the right of American politics about the legitimacy or the perceived illegitimacy of the 2020 election. I think that they were narratives that were wholly focused on presenting the American elite as being um, manipulative, anti-democratic, and opposed to the, the view of the people, the, the voice of the, the forgotten people. Some of those narratives can be traced back through the Trump presidency, some of those narratives clearly were shaped and influenced by uh, the legacy of Steve Bannon. I don't know if he was personally involved in January the 6th or if he was advocating for that, but I think it's certainly fair to say that many of the people who participated in those events were clearly influenced by the ideology of Trumpism, and that in turn was shaped by many of the people that were around Trump. Based on the committee's investigation, it appears that Mr. Bannon had substantial advanced knowledge of the plans for January 6th and likely had an important role in formulating those plans. Mr. Bannon was in the war room at the Willard on January 6th. He also appears to have detailed knowledge regarding the president's efforts to sell millions of Americans the fraud that the election was stolen. 
In the words of many who participated in the January 6th attack, the violence that day was in direct response to President Trump's repeated claims from election night through January 6th that he had won the election. The American people are entitled to Mr. Bannon's first-hand testimony about all of these relevant facts. As part of the ongoing investigation into the January the 6th events of the Capitol, that Steve Bannon was called to give evidence regarding his role in those events and activities. Bannon refuses to cooperate with Congress because it's he feels he's he's above it. He feels that this is not something he should feel obliged to do as a free citizen. You know, it's two fingers to the establishment. As simple as that. I'm telling you right now, this is going to be the misdemeanor from hell for Merrick Garland, Nancy Pelosi, and Joe Biden. Joe Biden ordered Merrick Garland to prosecute me from the White House lawn when he got off Marine One. And we're going to do, we're going to go on the offense. We're tired of playing defense. We're going to go on the offense on this and stand by. Mr. Bannon had acted as his lawyer counseled him to do by not appearing and by not, and by not turning over documents in this case. He didn't refuse to comply. He wants to be seen as an outsider who's willing to take on the elite, who doesn't want to play by their rules. Somebody who relishes in being a populist maverick, a renegade, and who is keenly aware that his brand is now completely dependent upon that image. So, you know, any opportunity that he has to push that, I think is important to him. I think the other consideration is that the Trump moment is not over. I think Bannon is keenly aware that Trump will probably run again for president or that Trump will remain a guiding influence on the Republican Party. So from a purely selfish point of view, maintaining and upgrading his brand as an anti-elite agitator outsider is also something that makes complete sense to him. They put forward an argument today that completely tears asunder constitutional principle of separation of powers. So think about it. Any citizen gets a subpoena from Congress hires an experienced lawyer, the lawyer tells that citizen, you may not comply. Not we ought to think about it. Former president invoked executive privilege, you may not comply. Again, you can debate whether he could have complied in part or in full. He listened to his lawyer. It's not an intuitive process. I only have one disappointment, and that is the gutless members of that show trial committee, the J6 committee, didn't have the guts to come down here and testify in open court. Committee, That's sir, sir, sir. Committee. This is something he does deliberately. You know, he, he could afford to take the $6,000 fine. That's $6,000 of pure, pure golden publicity all over the globe. You know, four months in jail, if he ever ends up serving it, so what? He doesn't bother him at all. In fact, I think Bannon would be the type of man who'd regard a jail sentence given to him for failing to turn up to Congress as kind of a way an actor would regard an Oscar. It would prove how much of a disruptor he is by being sent to jail. He likes being the bad boy. I think a lot of people who are drawn into these movements who flirt with the fringes and who are trying to stretch the Overton window of what's acceptable and what's allowed, I think are always people who have the potential to be dangerous, certainly, because they can sometimes create things that end up getting momentum and end up getting a degree of power that they can't always control. The line between critiquing the system and advocating for radical reform and political violence is a very, very thin line. Just a few days before the election, Steve Bannon, a former Trump chief White House strategist and outside advisor to President Trump, spoke to a group of his associates from China and said this. And what Trump's going to do is just declare victory, right? He's going to declare victory. But if that doesn't mean he's the winner. He's just going to say he's the winner. The Democrats, more of our people vote early that count. Theirs voted in May. And so they're going to have a natural 
disadvantage and Trump's gonna take advantage of that's our strategy. He's gonna turn himself a winner. So when you wake up Wednesday morning, it's gonna be a firestorm. <laughs> also, also if Trump <laughs> is if Trump is losing by 10 or 11 o'clock at night, it's gonna be even crazier. Crazy. No, because he's going to sit right there and say they stole it. I'm, yeah. the court, uh, Agreed. I'm directing the attorney general to shut down all ballot places in all 50 states. It's going to be no. He's not going out easy. If, Trump, if Biden's winning, Trump is going to do some crazy shit. As you know, Mr. Bannon refused to testify in our investigation. He's been convicted of criminal contempt of Congress, and he's awaiting sentencing. But the evidence indicates that Mr. Bannon had advanced knowledge of Mr. Trump's intent to clear victory falsely on election night, but also that Mr. Bannon knew about Mr. Trump's planning for January 6th. Here's what Bannon said on January 5th. All hell is going to break loose tomorrow. It's all converging and now we're on, as they say, the point of attack. Camera, keep camera. So, as you know, Mr. Bannon was sentenced there today. Are cameras. You don't assault me. Stop pushing, buddy. You were here last As time. usual, we love that vote. As usual, uh, the judge listened carefully and uh, entered a decision that he thought was appropriate. We certainly fully respect hey, the judge's decision, me, right? but uh, we will be filing a notice of appeal, as the judge indicated. And this is a broader question over how mainstream Democrats respond to populism. There is an indirect response, which is tackling the grievances that are leading people to vote for these movements. And there is a direct response, which is going after the people who are actively leading and shaping these movements. The risk with that strategy of going after the individuals is that it can often sometimes just look like persecution. And you end up exacerbating rather than soothing their supporters. This is by far the most serious and politically charged indictment. He's accused of undermining a foundational principle of American democracy, the peaceful transfer of power. An ideal Bannon world would be uh, a very small state existing just on a national level with no federalism across continents in which people wouldn't be seen as kind of economic units. They'd be kind of like in warrior roles or priest roles, almost a kind of perfect kind of medieval society. It, it, it's a society based on sort of mysticism rather than capitalism. You know, he is very esoteric. People forget this. Bannon is really out there. Steve Bannon will probably go down in history, rightly or wrongly, as one of the most influential people within the US Republican movement who will be intimately connected in the history books with the presidency of Donald Trump, who will be closely associated with the global populist movement against the established elite who will probably be seen as a threat to American democracy. These people are part of that swamp that needs to be drained. Um. And as somebody who captured the zeitgeist at the time, somebody who tapped into this mood, as somebody who may have led the Republicans away from uh, a much more sustainable path, to ongoing dominance over the political system. We'll have to wait and see.